Welcome to this week's At Home Worship. And our scripture today is the beginning of Paul's epistle to the Philippians. And it begins with a prayer. And prayer is, tends to be something that works especially well in two circumstances that couldn't be more different. <laughs> one of them is at the end of your rope, and the other one is when you're walking on cloud nine. We talk a lot about the end of our rope, and we would do well to talk a little bit more when you're on cloud nine. What Paul witnesses to us, and at the very end of Philippians, he just comes out and says it, what does that for us is this promise that God is the one who's handling things. That all of our efforts, they're meant for our neighbors, they're not for ourselves, they're not ways we try to bring in the kingdom of God ourselves. And when we think that's what our efforts are for, that is the surest way to find yourself at the end of your rope. But when you have a promise like Paul does, that God is busy working, often working in hidden ways and most certainly unexpected ways, but when you have that promise, suddenly you're just walking on cloud nine. It's all a gift. And that's the promise that we have, and we'll get more into that in our service. But for now, having some of that, let the promise that God's the one who's in control free us up to pray. We're going to pray together Martin Luther's morning prayer. Let us pray. I give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected me through the night from all harm and danger. I ask that you would also protect me today from sin and all evil, so that my life and my actions may please you. Into your hands I commend myself, my body, my soul, and all that is mine. Let your holy angel be with me, so that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. And what we talked about, of the promise that God is in control, giving us our lives and creation back as a gift, one of the ways we put aside the lie that it's all up to us is we stop trying to prop ourselves up. We confess those ways we've fallen short. We confess those ways we've done even more than fallen short, which is act on our worst impulses. In other words, we confess our sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's children say, Amen. Let us confess our sin. God of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you and against others, both knowingly and unknowingly. You call us to love and we hate. You call us to peace and we bring violence. You call us to be generous and we are greedy. Lord, for these sins and all that we confess now in the silence of our hearts, we have merited your wrath. Forgive us, Lord. and now receive your absolution. We're gonna have some time of prayer and reflection, but then we will have the reading of Holy Scripture. And that passage ends with Paul updating the Philippians about his circumstances, and you know what? They're not all that great. But you know what? Paul can't stop rejoicing. He can't stop rejoicing because he sees through everything else to God working in these unexpected places. And in our sins, that is one such unexpected place. But that is where God gets to work. It is where Jesus keeps his promise from the cross. Father, forgive them. Receive this, God's greatest work, the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's children say, Amen. And so as we said, we continue now with some time of reflection and prayer.
the Holy Scripture according to the Epistle to the Church in Philippi, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. <clears throat> Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work of you will bring it to the completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For the God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with greater boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defense of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and my imprisonment. What does it matter? Just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, Paul isn't writing this epistle to the folks at First Lutheran in Philippi for any old reason. No, Paul's writing this letter to the church that he's founded because this church is facing a crisis. And as their founder, Paul knows that he is the only one who can address this mess. What's happened, as Paul relates at the very top of this correspondence, is that the founder of their church has been incarcerated. That's right, incarcerated. I'm not being too subtle here, am I? Paul's writing this letter that's become a part of Holy Writ, by the way, because he is in the Huskow. Paul is in jail. And unsurprisingly, this turn of events has caused a bit of a stir back at the congregation that Paul himself helped get off the ground. It's really not that surprising that this incident has precipitated a bit of a quandary, is it? After all, how would you like to be known as the member of a church whose pastor was in jail? Do you think it would help your church's credibility? Would you be happy about the attention this fact has caused? No, of course not. Of course not. But that's the bind the folks in Philippi find themselves in. And as such, Paul knows that he needs to face the music. However, however, you will notice uh, as you read this letter that Paul doesn't bother to defend himself. In fact, as you hear this letter, you get the distinct impression that the thought hasn't even crossed Paul's mind. Rather, Paul is writing for another reason altogether. Paul's touching base with this beloved people of God because something unexpected has happened. And what has happened is that when Paul got locked up, the gospel got loose. When Paul got locked up, the gospel got loose. Paul sends word to the folks in Philippi not to rehabilitate his image, but to help them. To help them. Locked up in the pokey of all places, Paul experienced that sweet freedom of Christ and it showed him, literally showed him, that the folks who were really in a bind 
were the ones in Philippi. So I just got back from something called the Synod Assembly. All you, you church pros, you know what this means, but the assembly is one of these big uh, church gatherings in our area. And while I was there, I got the pleasant of experience of sitting right where you are right now. I got to sit back in the pew for once. I didn't have to lead worship. I got to experience it. And as satisfying as that experience was, and it was, it drove home to me that the really hard part of worship is mustering the wherewithal. The wherewithal to dare to hope that something is actually happening during worship. It's easy to feel like we're just going through the motions, isn't it? When this mean old world keeps right on spinning along as indifferently as ever, it can feel like what we're doing is just a bunch of whistling in the dark, can't it? In other words, like the Philippians, it can be so oh so easy for us to think that theology is just a bunch of ideas about God. It can be tempting to sing along with that great dad rock band Wilco, uh, the song Theologians. And it goes like this, Theologians, they don't know nothing about my soul. That's the way it so often seems. But what has Paul head over heels is that in Christ, those notions we confess about God aren't just mere concepts. On the contrary, on the contrary, they're declarations about what God does. And thanks be to God, cries Paul, that God is not a one and done kind of God. After all, just take a look at Paul. There he is in the clink, but all his confinement has done is set the gospel loose. Paul's been detained but that's just made his fellow preachers all the more bold to do exactly what got him locked up. Instead of cowing them down, it's made his fellow preachers more bold. And those old opponents of Paul's, you know the ones who always got antsy about this grace alone Paul preached? Well, they're using his diminished status to try and build their brand. But when Paul looks around, all he can see is that same message of amazing grace being preached being preached by those opponents even in spite of themselves. And that's why, that's why although Paul has nothing to be happy about, he can't stop rejoicing. And Paul, good preacher that he is, good pastor that he is, he wants to send word back to this beloved congregation to share the freedom that he's received, the freedom that he is standing on the receiving end of, the freedom that he experienced in the slammer of all places. Paul wants to share that freedom only Christ can give, that freedom that gets loose when we get pinned down, that freedom that gets loose when we get pinned down. You know, if you're anything like me, you're here today with more than your fair share of, let's say, stuff. <laughs> but sometimes another word comes to mind. And if you're anything like me, all this stuff's got you all twisted up. And if you're anything like me, you're here after a week of doing anything and everything you can to try and get some relief from whatever impasse you're caught in. And if you're anything like me, all you have to show for it are the bumps and bruises you have from pulling against those stubborn old chains that won't budge an inch. You see, today though, right here and right now, Paul bursts into our midst to shout something through the ages. To shout something that in the name of Christ is still true. To shout something that by the power of Christ is just as real as the sound of my voice and the heartbeat in your chest. Let me say that again so it's clear. You see, Paul has to tell us something, that by the power of the risen Lord, it is as real as the sound of my voice that you're hearing right now and the heartbeat in your chest that is pumping right now. Are you ready to hear it? Are you ready to hear it? Okay. Here it is. 
when Christ died on the cross, something actually happened. And not just to Christ either. No, when Christ died, he took the powers of sin and held down right along with him. And then, when God raised Christ from the dead, something literally world-altering occurred too. When Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, when Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, a new humanity was birthed. A new people called Christian. A new people brought to life by baptism into Christ's death. A new people who have been freed to live on the other side of sin and death's rotten old dominion. What's more, proclaims Paul, this locked up Freeman, this new thing Christ has wrought, it is working itself out, working itself out right here and right now for you on the other side of the screen. It is working itself out among you and among me. But this new thing of Christ It doesn't play by the rules of this old world. No, Christ's work is topsy-turvy to this worn-out world's way of doing things. For instance, as Paul himself has experienced, now freedom happens right when and where you can't do anything for yourself anymore. Like Paul's literal prison or all those other prisons we find ourselves caught, caught in on this side of eternity. You see, there's plenty of examples, and Paul's already mentioned a few of them in this short passage, and he'll mention more before he finishes his letter too. But that's the stuff for another sermon. (laughs) So for now, suffice it to say, everything out there that that makes what happens right now seem like a bunch of falderall, that is actually precisely where Christ is getting to work in your life. Everything that made you think you'd do just as well to not bother with worship today, you see, that is the cloth Christ is cutting your life from to actually make a Christian out of you, to make you a person who has been set free from that reign of that rotten old triumvirate, sin, death, and the devil. Yes, for now, it's hard to see. I know for my part, it's always been nearly impossible to spot this reckless work of God in the moment. It's always looked to me like death at the time. But after God has carried me kicking and screaming through another turn of redemption, I have often looked back and caught a glimpse of what I couldn't see in the moment. God's most blessed work. God's work that wrenches life from death. God's work that forges freedom out of the chains of our captivity. And that's right where Paul is addressing you from today and me from today. And Paul's not sending word just to say, guess what's happened to me? No, he's writing to tell us, guess what's happening to you? Guess what Christ has done, what Christ is doing, what Christ does, does to you and to me. And that's why the the beloved old hymn, it still proves true. Blessed be the tie that binds. Yes, blessed be those old times ties. Blessed be them because it was in them, right where we were most bound, that we finally experienced this upside-down freedom of Christ. That freedom of Christ that makes Christians out of you and me all over again. The freedom of Christ that sets us free right where we are most bound. That freedom of Christ that makes us alive out of all those deaths we're bumping up again. And Lord knows there's no shortage of them. And seeing as God is busy doing this thing right now in your life, and it's so overwhelming, so topsy-turvy, let's take a moment for reflection.
And now we continue our worship with uh, thanksgiving for the word, giving thanks for the gift of God's word that, that um, centered and motivated and made the momentum of this entire service. And after each one of the petitions of thanksgiving, I will conclude with, for your word of life, O God, and the response is, we give you thanks and praise. Let us pray. Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word you made all things. You spoke light into darkness, called forth beauty from prey, beauty from chaos, and brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. By your word you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. And through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love. For your word of life, O oh God, we give you thanks and praise. And now send your spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, and deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. And all God's children say, Amen. And so now, be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Indeed, thanks be to God. And let us continue lifting our voices in thanksgiving with our hymn and the sermon I Reference, blessed be the ties that bind, but we also on Sunday sang, sang Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, which is such a lovely hymn, and it was a great moment, and we want to share that with you. So that'll be the hymn we sing together, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. What a fellowship, what a joy divine. <laughs> receive your blessing. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. And now we conclude our charge. It's that prayer Jesus himself taught us. Every time we pray this prayer, we keep his command. And so, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Amen. All right, well, as far as announcements go, as we've been saying, really the best way to see what's going on is to check out our website. It has that at the end, or you can go on our social media page and, and see what's going on. But as far as looking ahead, our website's really the best bet. You know, we have Vacation Bible School coming up in June. In August, we'll be going to camp. We're getting Stephen Ministry started. We'll be getting book group going soon. We're collecting for social concerns. And those are just a few of the things. So um, you can tool around our website. It also has our contact us. And you can be in touch that way. You can send us a message or an email, a call, and we can just chat to, to get to know each other, I suppose, and talk about what's going on. Otherwise, if you want to worship with us in person, right here, this is Faith Lutheran on Sunnyside. We meet on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m., and all people are welcome indeed. But now, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.